الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان Assalamu alaikum my friends welcome to another episode of the Revelation audio experience this is Miraj Muhyiddin i'm so happy that you guys are with me today we're going to be talking about the life of the prophet Muhammad peace upon him in his 20s going into his 30s we are at section prologue 4.3 if you're following along in the revelation book right now um we were talking about in the last episode we were talking about the prophet Muhammad peace upon him in his 20s we left off with the pact of chivalry now the prophet Muhammad peace upon him is in his 20s and he's become fairly involved in the caravan business so he's kind of graduated on from the life of the shepherd and now he's being getting involved more in business and trading and so forth and it was soon he was asked to start ch- taking care of other people's uh goods so he was going kind of as an agent for other people because he still didn't have enough to have his own caravan uh one of the people uh who he started uh becoming an agent for or working for was a very wealthy uh lady a widow by the name of Khadija bint Khuwailid and she was from the Quraysh clan of Asad now Khadija was a very noble woman she was well known throughout the city and she had hired Muhammad as someone who could take care of her stuff because women tended not to go out on these caravan routes now on one instance the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was going to Syria under taking care of Khadija's uh, goods and he was paid twice the usual rate and given a young servant named Maisara for the trip when they were on this trip Another situation happened similar to the narration I told you about Bahira the monk but in this situation they meet a Christian monk named Nestor and Nestor observes uh, Muhammad peace be upon him and he confides in Maisara his companion that there is something special about this man and that he is destined to become a prophet now in one of the other sira books it suggests that nestor may have been a nestorian christian and nestorian christians believe that jesus had both human and godlike natures that were distinct entities in the same person now we don't know that for sure but remember when we talked about christianity the idea of trinitarian christianity was something that was happening in the roman empire a lot of the christians who lived in arabia and in persia and so forth had other beliefs some were probably more closer to the original orthodox teachings of isa alayhi salam and if isa alayhi salam did mention that ahmad was coming as we heard in previous episodes it is possible that nestor had, was holding on to those sayings because they were still uh, in existence another thing that I'll note right here not to stir up too much controversy but there is a set of verses in the book of genesis that many scholars suggest speak to the coming of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him this uh these verses go as such and jacob called unto his sons and said so this is yaqub alislam calling all the 12 tribes together all right and he said He called unto his sons and said, "Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which will befall you in the last days. The scepter shall not pa- depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be." So what is going on here? Now, according to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's interpretation of this, he says that although the Christians interpret Shiloh to mean Christ, if you look at the verses in Genesis, Jacob is a prophet from Bani Israel, foretelling of a prophet who will not be from Bani Israel. The verse doesn't make any sense if it is Jesus because Jesus is a direct descendant of Daud al-Islam, according to their own tradition. Jesus is from the children of Jacob, so he does not fit this category. So what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is saying is that the scepter when jacob is saying the scepter shall not depart from judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until shiloh comes he is saying that shiloh must be someone outside of bani israel and the only person who could that would be is the prophet muhammad peace be upon him but regardless of what it says in genesis we know in the quran isa alayhi salam did warn his people that a man named ahmed was coming and ahmed is a name of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him So now returning from this trip, Maisara goes to Khadija and tells Khadija about Nestor's prediction. 
Khadija now has a cousin, and Khadija's cousin's name is Waraka. Who is Waraka? Waraka was one of uh, was a man who was a Christian Hanif. So he was one of those monotheists that is meant that I mentioned to you when we talked about the religions around Arabia. And when Waraka hears what Khadija says, he corroborates Nestor's prediction. So Sayyidina Khadija at this point is excited, and she turns to her friend Nufesa and has Nufesa extend an offer of marriage to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Then, when he welcomes the offer, Sayyidina Khadija went directly to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and she said, Oh, son of my uncle, I love you for your kinship with me and that you're always in the center. You're never being a partisan amongst the people for this or for that. And I love you for your trustworthiness and for the beauty of your character and the truth of your speech. What we see here is that Sayyidina Khatija recognized the most salient features of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Obviously, he was the most best looking amongst the people of Mecca. We know that. He had the most beautiful attributes. But the thing that she really saw in him was that he was alameen. He was trustworthy. He was a siddiq. He was truthful. He was balanced. He was moderate. He was not an extremist on the left side or the right side. He was someone who was always there to compromise and to help bring people together. This is what Sayyidina Khatija saw in the Prophet Muhammad peace be him, and what attracted her to him. Now, what's interesting is that the clans of Hashim and the clan of Asad, which was a clan of Sayyidina Khatija, they had several pre-existing ties. And the biggest tie of all, the closest to the Prophet, peace be upon him, was that his aunt, Safiya, who remember, Safiya was his playmate, but she was also his aunt, she had already married Khatija's brother, whose name was Awam. Now, I told you in the previous episodes that Safiya was an aunt of the Prophet and one of his favorite aunts. And Safiya's uh, son was one of the Prophet, peace be upon him, closest companions later on, and his name was Zubair ibn al Awam. Well, the reason why he's al Awam is because his father's name was Awam, and Awam was the brother of Khatija. See, this is where the seerah gets fascinating for me is that if you just say Zubair ibn al Awam, no one really knows what that means. But we know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that every Prophet had a disciple, and my disciple is Zubair. He loved this boy who was a boy to the Prophet, peace be upon him. He loved this companion so incredibly dearly. And recognize now, aside from the greatness of Zubair ibn al Awam, is the fact there's a very close kinship tie in that Zubair's mother is none other than the Prophet's beloved aunt and playmate. And Zubair's father is the brother of the Prophet's wife, Khatija. So this is, to me, the richness of the seerah. It's just one example of hundreds of examples of how relationships matter. And relationships bring this dimension to the names that you just can't get just by reading names and passing by them. So what we see here is because of this situation, Hamza, is, because Hamza is Safiya's sister, he is chosen to accompany his 25-year-old nephew, Muhammad, to Khatija's uncle's house to officially ask for her hand in marriage. Now, prior to this, the Prophet Muhammad had already asked Abu Talib for the hand of Abu Talib's daughter, Fakhita, to marry. That was his first cousin. But Abu Talib had actually refused that offer because he wanted to have his daughter be married to a Makhzumi because the Makhzumis were more moneyed people and had more stability. But despite being turned down from that offer, the Prophet peace be upon him is now accepting this offer from Sayyidina Khatija. Now, interestingly enough, Sayyidina Khatija had a... Uh, got a gift from the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, in the form of a servant who the Prophet had, whose name was Baraka. This lady, Baraka, is one of the most important people in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. Baraka later has a son named Ayman, and from then on, she is known as Um Ayman. Who is this person, Baraka? She is someone who has been with the Prophet his entire life and actually outlives the Prophet. Peace be upon him. She was the one who was with the Prophet in Abwa and helped bury his mother Amina. 
So this lady who is with the Prophet, this nurse of the Prophet, peace upon him, is alongside him his entire life. And she is now given to help Sayyidina Khadija in the household. And it is said about these people who were the closest to the Prophet, peace upon him, they used to call him Ahmad because that was a name they knew him by. And they always referred to him as Ahmad even after prophethood because they had such a close connection to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they knew his house name. It's kind of, that's the level of intimacy that they had with him. Now, another person who's involved in this marital transaction is a young boy named Zayd, Zayd ibn Haratha. Many of you know the story of Zayd ibn Haratha, but just in very quick terms, Zayd was from the northern tribe of Kalb. And this is a place kind of near between Syria and Iraq. And he had been abducted and sold into servitude, kind of like the story of Yusuf al-Islam, who was abducted and taken away from his land. Uh, Zayd ibn Haratha was also taken away from his land, and he was brought to he ended up uh, you know, over a series of journeys in Mecca. Now, this boy Zayd was a servant of Khatija's at the time of the marriage. And at the marriage, Khatija gifts this servant to take care and help the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Zayd loves this new calling of his. Now, shortly after the marriage, while Zayd is with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he overhears that some people from Bani Kalb, his tribe, are visiting uh, Mecca. When he meets these people, he tells them, can you go back and tell my father if he's there that I am safe and happy here in Mecca. However, upon hearing the news, his father, whose name is Haratha, right? His name is Zayd ibn Haratha. So his father's name is Haratha. He comes to Mecca to pay for Zayd's freedom. And when the prophet sees this, he obviously was someone who had such incredible empathy that as much as he loved Zaid, he recognizes that a father longs for their son also. And he also recognizes that Zaid has his own desires about who he wants to be with. So when he tells, tells Zaid that he is free to return to his family, Zaid simply replies, and this is in front of his father, he says, I would not choose any man in preference to you. You are to me as my father and my mother. And I have seen things from this man that are things that I could never choose another above him. Now, this is incredible because Zayd says this in front of his own father. But upon hearing these words, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, declares publicly in front of everyone that, oh, you who are present, bear witness that Zayd is my son and I am his heir and he is mine. So he officially adopts Zayd as his son. And from that day on, Zayd is no longer referred to as Zayd ibn Haratha. He is referred to as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Now, interestingly enough, as we will see in the later uh, periods of the seerah, uh, the Quran comes down with revelation saying that when you adopt a child, you cannot change their name because it's very important for children to know who their real parents are. And so when that happens, Zayd has to go from Zayd ibn Muhammad back to Zayd ibn Haratha. The problem is he was so attached to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he did not want to leave that name Muhammad, is that from then on, instead of going back to his original father's names, he just went to being referred as Zayd Mawla Muhammad, a term used if you had a close family-like relation with somebody, specifically if someone had freed a slave. And so that's what Zayd held on to. Now Zayd's father Haratha obviously is very disheartened by the news, but at the same time he is happy that his son is being allowed to choose. And he is also happy that the person who he chose is such a, a trustworthy, beautiful soul. And so Haratha returns back to Kalb. I'm sure he was disappointed that he would, was not returning with his son, but that is how the end of the story goes. At least he returned home without any bitterness in his heart. And if you look on P, uh, figure P24, you will actually see the journey of Haratha coming to Mecca. You'll see exactly where Bani Kalb is in relation to uh, the Quraysh and Mecca. So that is kind of the, the story of the Prophet peace upon him in his 20s here. The big pic, uh, picture items is that he gets married during this time. He, we introduced two important people, namely Um Ayman, and we also introduced Zayd ibn Haratha. And of course, we now have, I will say this, my favorite person in the seerah, and that is uh, Sayyidina Khatija bin Khawailid. In my estimation, there is no person who is more important to the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, than Sayyidina Khatija. And that's with respect to everybody who we talk about. But because she didn't 
survive long enough to make it to the end, we don't have so many stories of her. But what we didn't do know is a prophet had a peace be upon him, had a special relationship with Khatija, Sayyidina Khatija, that he did not have with anyone else because she was there with him in the most difficult times and she gave the most. She sacrificed the most for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he loved her in a way that he could not match that kind of love with any other person around him, even with his other wives. So on that note, we're going to end this section talking about the life of the Prophet, peace upon him, in his 20s. In the next episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about Sayyidina Khadija and the family that she and the Prophet Muhammad built together. But we're going to save that for the section Prologue 4.4 coming up in the next episode. Meanwhile, feel free to share this if you thought it was beneficial for you and you, if you think it's beneficial for other people. Um, certainly get ready because we're going to be diving into the Quran very shortly and I'm super excited to do that. But first, we're going to finish out the story of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before revelation. Can't wait to see you guys soon. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون أولئك أصحاب الجنة خالدين فيها خالدين فيها جزاء بما كانوا يعملون